in any war, a miscalculation is baked into it, every war, because both sides think they'll win. So obviously someone has miscalculated because somebody's going to lose. Today, my guest is Elliot Ackerman, a former U.S. Marine Corps officer, White House fellow, CIA paramilitary operator, and the author of 2034, a novel of the next world war. What impact do you think the war in Ukraine has had on the possibility of World War III? Well, I think it's certainly increased the, uh, the potential for the type of miscalculation that could cause the world to sleepwalk into a broader conflict. Um, and oftentimes when we think about uh, wars and we look at them historically, they seem as though, oh, well, they were always a fait accompli. It was, it was destined to occur. Um, but the reality is, you know, wars are fought by human beings and human beings miscalculate. And uh, really in any war, uh, a miscalculation is, is baked into it, uh, every war. Um, because both sides think they'll win. So obviously someone has miscalculated because somebody's going to lose. Uh, and in Ukraine, you know, we see that type of miscalculation very clearly right up front. You know, the Russians did not expect to meet the type of stiff resistance that they've met so far in Ukraine. So you see that type of miscalculation right there, you know, that has caused them to change their strategy. So, you know, so absolutely, I think the, the war in Ukraine um, has shown that we don't live in a post great nation state conflict world. You know, these types of wars can still happen. So I think it should serve as a wake up call for us. Mm -hmm. And what do you think has been the biggest factor in the war in Ukraine so far? What stood out to you? Well, I, you know, I think one of the things we don't talk about enough um, is the war in Ukraine in context of the end of the war in Afghanistan. I mean, those are two events that are, I think, certainly linked together. I think you can drop a plumb line from the events uh, that occurred when NATO withdrew from Afghanistan in August of 2021 uh, with Russia's decision to invade Ukraine. So if you look uh, at the NATO withdrawal, um, I would say that was probably one of the darkest chapters in the history of the alliance, the way we saw the United States and NATO really being dictated terms of withdrawal by, you know, 50 some thousand Taliban fighters, the chaotic images coming out of the airport in Kabul. Uh, and those were certainly images that Vladimir Putin saw that summer as he was weighing you know, when and if to enter Ukraine. And of course, one of the variables was, you know, what type of resistance did he think he would see from NATO? Um, but it's really dizzying that within six months of NATO's darkest moment, we see what I would argue is one of the brightest chapters in the history of the alliance, which is the way that the alliance overperformed when confronted by Russian aggression in Ukraine. So it's been this sort of dizzying series of geopolitical events that have occurred in the past 18 months. And I think we're still trying to uh, just to, to catch up with where we're at. Mm -hmm. And you've written about your experience with all things in Afghanistan. Um, what makes Afghanistan, in your words, a, a betrayal or a collapse of American morals? Well, you know, the, I served in Afghanistan, you know, fought there. Uh, and it's an issue I followed closely for a long time. And so the, the verb that I, uh, at least with the draw, uh, settled on was collapse more than anything. Um, I think it showed a collapse of American competence that, uh, you know, outside of, you know, the, the actions taken by the people who are at the airfield, you know, the soldiers, Marines, State Department officials there who are all, I mean, heroic. Um, dealing in a pretty, you know, dealing with an incredibly difficult situation the best that they could. But, you know, watching this sort of strategic incompetence that led to them being in that situation was sort of a collapse of American competence. I would say it was a collapse of our morals. Um, we were leaving uh, hundreds of thousands of our allies behind. And if anything, you know, a whole nation behind who we had made decades worth of promises to. Um, I think, you know, for a lot of veterans like myself, it was a collapse of time in that, you know, a war we thought we left a long time ago was suddenly front and center in our lives again as we were trying to either get our Afghan allies out or get their families out. Um, so collapse was sort of the word that, that I settled on, although many others have used the stronger term betrayal. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, what do you think victory would have looked like in Afghanistan to, to sort of compare targets? Well, it, it's interesting. I mean, you know, listen, I write about war and I'm always sort of fascinated by the narratives that we tell ourselves about war. So, you know, how do you define victory, right? Victory are a certain set of con conditions by which, you know, you think you've won. So it's sort of like when, when a nation is able to tell itself a story, so this story is the acceptable narrative for how we win the war. Now, sometimes it's a very clear narrative, right? Like in the Second World War, where it's, you know, unconditional surrender, a signing ceremony on a battleship, obviously won. But oftentimes, you know, victory can be something that is a, a, a little bit more muddled. Uh, I think in Afghanistan, uh, I have never been someone who thought we should have withdrawn in the first place. I think the way we got ourselves in a lot of trouble in Afghanistan is we were telling ourselves the wrong story about that war. And we had started telling ourselves as Americans this narrative in which victory and winning the war would occur when all of our troops came home. Uh, and we always seem to, you know, when did the, you know, what's the exit strategy? How do we get our troops out? That's something we hear pretty constantly. Well, if you look at the history of American warfare, um, at least the wars we've won or even fought to a draw, the troops don't come home. I mean, the Second World War, all the troops didn't come home at the end of the Second World War. We still have tens of thousands of U.S. troops garrisoned in uh, in Western Europe and even in Eastern Europe that are residuals from the Second World War. Those are the ones securing the peace with NATO right now as we see Russia's aggression in Ukraine. If you look at the Korean Peninsula, we have 50,000 troops on the Korean Peninsula still. In fact, the only time all of the U.S. troops come home at the end of the war is when we lose the war. <laughs> so somewhere along, you know, like Vietnam, all the troops came home at the end of Vietnam. All the troops have now come home at the end of Afghanistan. You know, if you look actually ironically at Iraq, which is a war that like I wouldn't argue the U.S. won the war in Iraq, but I actually wouldn't go so far as to say that we we lost. I think you've sort of had a, a muddled result there. I mean, in Iraq, they've had sort of four consecutive parliamentary elections. Um, you know, you have a dysfunctional government, but it is a representative government that does still exist in Iraq. And we still have troops in Iraq. So. Um, so when we look at Afghanistan, you know, what would victory have meant in Afghanistan? I think it depends a little bit on the story that we tell ourselves. You know, I think there was an outcome. You know, if you look at the height of the war in Afghanistan during the surge, which is when I fought there, uh, you know, we had over 100,000 U.S. troops stationed in Afghanistan engaged in direct combat operations. By the time we started negotiating with the Taliban, we had about 10,000 troops. So we had already completed a 90 percent withdrawal of U.S. forces from the country. And the question becomes is, you know, could we have declared victory if we left about 10,000 U.S. troops in Afghanistan? We saw the Afghan military able to deal with the Taliban and continue to, you know, fight against the Taliban. And those 10,000 U.S. troops were taking de minimis casualties. And I think that would be a certain brand of victory. And we fought wars like that in the past. But I think in our American minds, when we were thinking about Afghanistan, we were often thinking sort of in these terms of, you know, the Second World War. And it was either we build this uh, Jeffersonian democracy that, you know, looks and flourishes like a Germany or a Japan, or we've lost. And I would say that's the wrong story. The story we should have been telling ourselves about Afghanistan was probably more of the story like U.S. involvement in Colombia, which evolved over three decades, was also a narco war. And in fact, was where I would argue the United States won. Um, but it was a long, long slog. Uh, with small numbers of U.S. troops with with ups and downs. So I think we get in a lot of, you know, what is victory in Afghanistan or how do you win a war? So much of that foundationally is what's the story we're telling ourselves about the war. Mm -hmm. And this part that you're saying about about troops coming home, too, it's um, maybe counterintuitive because I think a lot of us have images of a victory in a war being parades and, and people coming home. And, and we forget those those facts that you point out about a lot of people stay behind. Right. Yeah. And um, and it gets yeah and again it's um, the narratives the stories that we're telling ourselves about were critically important um, you know for instance you know when people think about like September 11th uh, I remember I, you know, I remember where I was on September 11th but my real memory from that time is actually what I was doing two nights before on September 9th 2001 and I was a college student then I was in the ROTC program I was heading into the military and. Um, a TV show was premiering that Sunday night on HBO and I had commandeered the television for my roommates because I wanted to watch the first episode and it was Band of Brothers, the first episode of Band of Brothers, you know, the iconic Steven Spielberg miniseries about uh, paratroopers in World War II. 
And it's funny when you look at the zeitgeist right now, I feel like uh, a series like Band of Brothers, which is admittedly a very sentimental look at the greatest generation, you know, is probably a series that wouldn't kind of play quite as well today. I think we're a little bit more jaded in America, a little more cynical. Um, but it's a series that really speaks to that moment in 2001. And what were the types of stories we as a nation craved? What were the stories we were telling ourselves? And it was those stories of the greatest generation going in to liberate an oppressed people. Those were the stories that we were craving two days before September 11th. And then September 11th happened. And I would argue we projected those stories onto our wars in the Middle East. Wow. So with this understanding of, of stories and the way that we're looking at things, now that we're about two years away from Afghanistan, what can we say about the moment that we're in now? What are we learning from that? What stories should we be embracing or be aware of? Well, I think one of the things, one of the things that is really interests me when you think about national security and the conversations happening right now with national security is the the national security concerns that really dominated so much of my life, sort of in my twenties and my thirties, were all about terrorism. You know, terrorism was the great national security fixation of the United States, um, and uh, and then you know wars against the Islamic State uh, in Syria, and very quickly we've turned away from that. And now we're talking again, sort of, you know, this back to the future moment, because now we're back to talking about great power competition and the threat from Russia, the threat from China and, uh, and the Iranians. And I think that's, I think strategically that's, that's appropriate. And that's what we, we should be uh, talking about. But I think in some ways, ironically, the, the greatest threat, uh, or the greatest harm that the war on terror inflicted against the United States was, is it kept us from focusing on great power competition for really two decades and allowed our adversaries, you know, our, our traditional antagonists, nations like Russia and a nation like China and Iran to have all of this runway to build out their military capability. So now we're sort of strangely sitting here in 2022 uh, watching you know, these very conventional wars being fought in places like Ukraine and speculating about, you know, naval battles in places like the Taiwan Straits. So that that is uh, so there's been a lot of change in the conversations going around around national security, uh, you know, really just in the last 24 months. Mm -hmm. So looking at China, what would be your biggest concern about China right now? Well, I think, you know, one thing that's important to note is the, you know, the I think the, the, the COVID protests we've seen in China in the past few weeks are a, a very good reminder of how volatile authoritarian regimes are, um, because as much as they might seem as though they have an iron grip on their own people, they, they do until they don't. And when they don't, uh, the change is swift, precipitous, and often violent. Um, but... You know, that being said, when we, you know, when we imagine what a uh, Chinese invasion of Taiwan would look like, I think, you know, the one thing that's just the most obvious is is, um, is the geography. That would be a conflict that the Chinese would be fighting in their backyard and that uh, the United States, along with its allies, would be fighting from, you know, across the Pacific Ocean, which puts us at a distinct disadvantage. But again, this sort of goes back to and it shows how everything is tied together. Because, you know, let's think about it. If we think about Afghanistan in that context, one of the reasons we left Afghanistan ostensibly was because we needed to stop focusing on countries like Afghanistan and refocus on great power competition. And I agree with that. But if we're imagining a war in Taiwan or a war against China, wouldn't it be nice for the United States to have access to some to strategic air bases in a country that shared a border with China? like Afghanistan. And we just gave up all those strategic air bases 18 months ago. Um, so I think also when we think about national security, it's, it's really important that we don't stovepipe these issues, that we always think about them in relation to one another. So just like there was a nexus between Afghanistan and Ukraine, you can see there's a nexus between China and Afghanistan, and there's a nexus between China and Russia. Um, so great power competition forces you to think much more three-dimensionally about strategy. Mm -hmm. And with this point about shared borders and strategic positioning. Um, what impact do you think the Belt and Road Initiative has had on the uh, situation with China? It's, it's something that came up in, in your novel 2034 about how, in theory, um, Iran could become pushed more into the arms of China through the Belt and Road. Um, what do you think about all that? 
Well, I think it, it, it listen, it shows that, you know, war is not just war. War is often about economic interests and economic alliances. And um, we, you know, we have to think about the alliances uh, and the axes of power that will come together against uh, U.S. interests. Now, the one thing the United States has always done very well, and you're seeing this in Ukraine right now, vis-a-vis -vis the Russians, is, you know, when we go to war, we go to war with our allies. Uh, that's the American way of war. It's what makes us strong. It's something that our adversaries don't do as well. And when they do ally with one another, um, the alliances aren't uh, typically as deep uh, and as rooted in uh, shared ideals. So I think what an initiative like Belt and Road shows is how the Chinese um, are leveraging economic incentives to build alliances across the world. And it's important to to watch that. Um, to counter that as well in many places. But th but also we should be mindful that uh, those alliances are different than the types of alliances that the United States has particularly participated in, which are not only economic alliances, but they're also alliances uh, of nations that have shared values. Mm -hmm. Elliot, on, on China, one thing that comes up a lot is China's demographics as well, that they seem to be experiencing a, a demographic decline as a result of the one-child policy um, so some would say that maybe they're not a threat, that maybe we should forget about them. Others, uh, I talked to Michael Beckley from Tufts, he said that this actually puts them under a time pressure and that they may lash out sooner than we expect. Um, what impact, if any, do you think demographics has for China? I think, I think demographics have a, have a huge impact. Um, I wouldn't disagree with Michael Beckley's uh, analysis. And I think if we look historically, we see examples when oftentimes the moment when a nation will lash out will be when it feels like it's at its strongest and when it also has no other choice. And if we look at the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, for instance, um, that attack was timed when to the Japanese, it seemed as though the U.S. involvement in the war was a fait accompli. And that, uh, you know, they were had a lot of pressure being put on them with regards to sanctions that had been placed on oil. I mean, you know, that was back in the 1940s. So with regards to the Chinese, um, if they are going to make this move on Taiwan, they're going to probably do it at the moment when they feel like they are uh, the strongest and when they feel and if they feel as though they're only getting weaker and weaker, the more time that passes. Um, but I don't think that necessarily means that there will definitely be a, a war in Taiwan and that war is completely unavoidable. I think there are just many, many variables that are weighing on this question. Um, some of them are demographic. You know, some of them are also uh, economic. And then some of them are specific to the internal politics uh, of China and whether you know she will be able to hold on to power as tightly as he has in recent years. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, Elliot, how did you get up to speed on, on so many of these factors? How did you go from being a Marine Corps infantry officer to having this, this broader perspective? Oh, that's a, that's a big question. I know I like to read. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I, uh, I, you know, I try to stay up on the news. I like to travel. Um, I like to keep my interests, you know, varied and eclectic. Um, but, uh, you know, these, you know, these are the issues that interest me. I, and I work as a journalist as well. And so I think being a journalist forces you, I'm a novelist and a journalist, it forces you to be out in the world and be talking with, um, you know, with interesting, with interesting people. So um, uh, I guess that's sort of how I transitioned from the Marine Corps to doing what I do now. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, you mentioned travel. I think maybe some people see travel as, as just an experience of uh, pleasure. You know, you can walk around, you try new food. Um, what impact does travel have on, on how you understand the world? Well, I like that type of travel a lot too, uh, the walk around and try new food type. Um, well, I, 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 you know, I've lived abroad for much of my life. I lived in Istanbul for many years and I think, and, and even as a Marine, uh, officer, when I served in Afghanistan, for instance, uh, I served in special operations as an advisor to Afghan units. So, you know, that was by definition, a very immersive experience. It was typically just me and a handful of Americans with advising several hundred Afghans, um, and as a journalist, I lived in Istanbul for many years. You know, that that was, uh, you know, an immersive experience uh, living as an expatriate. So um, as a journalist, I think the, you know, the, the best way to understand a story is to go immerse yourself in the story. And that often, you know, leads you beyond your, your own shores. Mm -hmm. um, Another place yeah. where, where people go to look for, for information is, is social media. Um, mm -hmm. One of our, our listeners would like to know, what impact do you think social media has on the way that uh, wars are conducted now? I think it has a huge impact. And really? I think we're seeing, yeah. And I think we're seeing that. Uh, for instance, the end, you know, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, 
you know, there was a refrain in the Biden administration before the withdrawal that, you know, this wasn't going to be Saigon. You know, you weren't going to see those types of images. You know, I, you know, I would argue it, it was worse than Saigon. It was Saigon as if every single person in Saigon had a smartphone. In Afghanistan, they did. So you, um, so not only are war, or you know, do the horrors of war exist as they've always existed, but they exist in a world where everyone is interconnected. Um, you know, their their wars now are being fought on Signal, WhatsApp, Telegram, the the flow of information, um, the way both sides have to keep a you know a really a real time hold of the narrative, the the challenge that exists with uh, false narratives. Uh, that are out there in a war. So we, you know, we have all this information. We are all connected in ways we've never been connected. So, um, you know, wars aren't just fought on the battlefield. They're also fought, I think, real time uh, as people can can watch what's going on and track troop movements. So I think social media has had a really big impact on the way that wars are not only fought, but the way they exist in our collective consciousness. Uh, you know, you know, historically, you know, we've often heard how one of the things that made the Vietnam War so poignant was every night it showed up in Americans' living rooms on the news. Well, a war like Ukraine is on every single person in the world's smartphone all day long. And you can see uh, how about the Ukrainians, the Russians, you know, and our collection of allies are pushing on information about that war. So I think it's had a really profound, a profound effect. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the need to sift through misinformation and things like that. Um, what do you do as a journalist to make sure that you're getting the right information, especially with all these sources? Sometimes they're not vetted, but it's coming so fast. How do you navigate that? Well, I, I mean, it's a challenge and you just have to educate yourself on who your who your source is. And, um, you know, I read mainstream media. I have people who write on Substack who I read. Uh, I have Twitter accounts that I follow and, um, you know, sometimes they're right, but sometimes they're wrong. And I'm always cross-referencing them with other sources that I have to try to dial down to the truth. So I don't think the, you know, the truth is something that any of us can expect to just receive from one source ex exclusively. I think the truth is something we all need to triangulate for ourselves. And that requires a little bit more uh, dexterity on the, the part of the individual. Mm -hmm. And you've written a whole novel about what a World War Three scenario could look like on this topic of technology. Um, how technologically different do you think a war in 2034 would be? Right. I mean, so, you know, my novel 2034 kind of imagines a war between the U.S. and China, primarily at sea in the aforementioned year. And one of the uh, the points that comes up very early on in the in, in this imagined war in the novel um, is that that war is precipitated with a massive cyber attack uh, on the part of the Chinese against the United States. And what that cyber attack brings into stark relief is that the the technological predominance that the United States has believed it enjoys militarily over China, which I think we just sort of assume oftentimes as Americans that, you know, our military is the best. And uh, yes, there might be some people challenging it, but they're not really there yet. It is actually false. And we realize that we don't enjoy those advantages. And so cyber acts as this significant leveler. And quite suddenly, the United States is in the midst of. Um, of a war against a true uh, peer nation. And it ta and at least in the novel, it takes us a little while to kind of get our minds around that. Um, and without giving too much away, um, there's a significant cyber component of the war, but there's also a significant nuclear component because, you know, as much as we might want to kid ourselves and believe that nuclear weapons and, you know, a nuclear World War Three is sort of a, a thing of the past, the thing we used to talk about in the 1980s during the height of the Cold War, but we still have all the all of the weapons. Um, you know, there's there's reports out this week about uh, China's significant expansion of its nuclear weapons program. Um, the challenge is we have all of those weapons, but we no longer have the deterrent regimes that we had when it was just the United States and the Soviet Union, this bipolar two superpower construct. Now it's a multipolar world, which means the the game theory around the use of nuclear weapons is much, much more complex and in many ways, much, much more dangerous and, you know, we've seen that with the war in Ukraine, with Russia rattling its nuclear saber. And if Russia were to ever do that, what the response would look like is much more multivariable than it had been in the past, because there's so many more actors with nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And you described cyber as a, a leveler. Um, what is the 
the move when cyber comes into play and it does level it? Is it to go low tech? Well, I think that's certainly the question, right? And if we, you know, if one of the things that's fascinating about thinking about war and writing about war is it is this endeavor that we have always engaged in as humans. So, like, yes, you know, the tools are different today and tomorrow there'll be something, new set of tools. You know, it's always been about, you know, humans, violence, and sort of finding the best tool to defeat your adversary. Um, and so it's not just enough to have the, you know, most expensive, most cutting edge piece of technology. You've got to have the right technology. Uh, and so, you know, in the scenario we imagine with 2034, you know, we as Americans have invested in all of these very exquisite systems, whether they're our state of the art joint strike fighters or our extremely expensive high tech carriers. But the Chinese are able to, through cyber, really take a lot of those systems offline. And the question becomes now, how do you fight? And uh, without spoiling too much of the book, we see a number of the characters realize that, you know, the way you fight technology isn't necessarily with a better technology, but it's in some ways with no technology. Uh, and so they fight in lower tech systems that don't have the, the, the vulnerability to being hacked by the Chinese. Mm -hmm. What do you think would, would be an effective approach like that? I, I hear more discussion of getting away from sort of legacy large platforms and things, more discussion of uh, smaller technologies, drone swarms, um, simpler devices. Um, what would be the, the best way to go about it? Well, I'm I want to answer your question, but I don't want to be prescriptive because sure. I think being prescriptive doesn't actually tell you how to go about it. I mean, so certainly, you know, listen, if you look at a platform like a an aircraft, a U.S. aircraft carrier, um, one can easily see how perhaps that type of a platform is vulnerable to, uh, you know, swarms of uh, unmanned uh, maritime vehicles or high tech uh, surface to surface anti-ship missiles in ways that an aircraft carrier in, let's say, I don't know, 1962 wasn't because those other technologies didn't exist. But that being said, you know, at least in the United States, the United States Navy, we have a culture that is a very aircraft centric culture, you know, a ship centric culture. Um, you know, who's the hero of the U.S. Navy? Well, it's Maverick. Well, who's Maverick without his his fighter plane? Well, he's he's nothing. So the culture, culture really matters because you need it's not so much that you need, you know, this weapon system or that weapon system is you need to have grown cultures where they are adaptable, where they're not sclerotic. When it's clear that some one weapon system isn't working, we're not clinging on to it for antiquated reasons. We're able to get rid of it, adapt and move to the next thing more quickly than our adversary can. So if that's the type of culture that exists within a nation and within its military. I would argue that's a war fighting culture that's going to be up to the task ahead of it. If it's sort of a sclerotic culture that can't move quickly, um, and I can see, we can see how uh, those will, those militaries were underperformed. And in some ways, we've seen that in Russia, uh, how that military, despite being you know very well equipped, you know very large on paper, has underperformed against a Ukrainian military, which has a very different culture. Um, and that is fighting a different type of war, which is an existential war for its survival. And we've seen on the Ukrainian side, like incredible adaptability because they have to adapt. For them, it's truly adapt or die. And uh, their culture, I would argue at this point, at least has outperformed the Russian culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, reading your work too, it just made me reflect on my own sort of indoctrination as a naval officer. And it was, it was very much that the aircraft carrier is our power, that it allows us to put force just about anywhere in the world pretty quickly. And that that, that is the ultimate value of the Navy. And now it seems that there there needs to be an evolution. I'm just curious, as an aside, have you ever seen Battlestar Galactica? I have, you know, when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. so there, there was a series, uh, a second round of the series, and um, mm -hmm. around the time of the start of the Iraq, Afghanistan, um, okay. everything. And uh, the premise is that it starts off with this battleship or the space battleship that um, doesn't have the technology to be hacked in the first place. And then mm -hmm. it's it's their fight. And I, I just wonder what, what truth there would be in that if, if we have a situation where maybe we need um, platforms that are resistant to hacking before other things. Well, I, I, you know, I think there's certainly truth to that. I mean, I think the lesson off, listen, I mean, you, you serve as a Navy officer. I serve as a Marine Corps officer. I remember when I fought in Iraq, I fought in the Fallujah battle in 2004. Oh. 
And I remember going into that battle, um, which was house to house, we were equipped with um, what at the time were these brand new, uh, basically, you know, uh, we called them small rounds, like bazooka rounds, basically. And they were thermobaric. And so we were explaining, you know, what these do. These are fuel air explosives. They can take down an entire building. We were told over and over again the praises of this new high tech bazooka round that we were going to be given. And the first time we shot them, they were more designed to kind of take out tanks. And they really they didn't work well at all. They were almost like too high tech and they would just sort of puncture a hole in a building. And so what we needed to go back to were actually these sort of older high explosive rounds that had been used in the Vietnam War because they were better just pushing down these walls. So, again, that's a very small um, example of, you know, having the newest technology isn't necessarily what gives you the advantage. It's like you got to have the right technology for the job. And, you know, and we see that, you know, you're, as a Navy officer, again, this whole story of the aircraft carrier, how the aircraft carrier became so preeminent um, was because our battleships got destroyed at Pearl Harbor. You know, mm -hmm. before Pearl Harbor, the, you know, the coin of the realm in the U.S. Navy was the battleship. And when all of ours got wiped out, that really for, I mean, we were sort of moving in that way anyways, but it forced upon us this moment where the aircraft carrier became preeminent. And you see that in the Second World War, but I think it's sort of a dangerous assumption 80 years out with all of the technological innovation to assume that, you know, the next war at sea between two peers will look a lot like a war 80 years before in the Second World War. I mean, it's gonna look different. And we're seeing the antecedents of that in, in Ukraine for instance, with the sinking of the uh, the Russian ship Moskva uh, with a uh, anti ship missile, so um, so this is all happening very quickly right now, and it's an interesting time to be sort of you know watching this space. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about your evolution too through all of this. Um, toward the end of the fifth act, you use the metaphor of comparing your time in service as being like being a, an elite football player. You compare it to kind of coming up through high school and college, and eventually the pros. You're CIA paramilitary. It's it sounds very exciting. Um, but then you kind of ask the question um, for like a football player, is the game what you want to do for the rest of your life? How did you answer that question? Well, it's a very personal question because it's different for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are many, I mean, many very dear friends of mine um, who I, I lo love and admire and have, have built my careers off of answer that question differently than I did. And they, you know, they still, you know, work in the military or work in intelligence. And, um, uh, and I'm a, great admirer of the direction their careers have gone and I'm very proud to have served them. So again, it's, it's not, you know, this is just a decision I came to. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we all, like Walt Whitman says, we all contain multitudes. And I just knew sort of in my heart, there were other things that I also wanted to do in my life. And so if I stayed on this path as a, a special operations officer, uh, you know, it would, there would be an opportunity cost, which would be, I wouldn't do these other things. So for me, you know, to extend that football analogy, um, I was like, you know, the, this isn't the only game I want to play for my entire life. There's other things I want to do, so I need to step away from the game, um, right? But like any athlete, you know, when you, you know, hang up your cleats, it's, it's an emotional moment, um, but it's one that I sort of came to. Um, many other people have, I think, come to a similar decision while others, you know, make their entire life in that game. Mm -hmm. And so now your, your game is writing. Uh, do, you see, do you see that being something for the long haul? Do you have another project in the works or um, is this maybe another phase? No, this is sort of what I'm doing uh, for the long haul. I think one of the great things about writing is it's, you know, it's very regenerative um, just because you write an article to write a book. It doesn't help you write the next article or book and the topic always shifts. So um, it's something that uh, is continually new. Uh, but um, regards to projects so uh, well 2034 is a is a, a trilogy so um we've uh jim stavridis and i have just finished the kind of early drafts of 2054 and handed that into our editor so that one will be coming out and it will be dealing with a, a civil war in the united states and technologically it will deal with um artificial intelligence and the integration of biological and technological evolution sort of what we call the singularity so um, so that will be set in 2054. And the last one, this series, 2074, uh, is going to be about the environment. So those are projects that the Admiral and I are doing together. And I continue to um, to to write articles. And then I have a novel, my own, that will be coming out called uh, Halcyon. It comes out in May of 23. And that is a, a novel set in an alternate 2004. But it deals with controversies surrounding Confederate war memorials. Um, so 
you know, I sort of have a range of range of interests in journalism and uh, in fiction, uh, and will continue to write. Wow, great. Well, you mentioned artificial intelligence. That was something I wondered about in 2034. There's so much talk of China and them getting ahead in artificial intelligence, having so much data because they can track people so much. Um, what role do you think artificial intelligence will have in more in the future? I mean, again, it has a huge it has a uh, a huge role to play. I think it's it enhances our capability. It speeds up decision making and our and our ability to process information um, for targeting. Uh, it's obviously you know is already playing a huge role, and um, you know it's it's limiting in some ways the human exposure, the amount of you know just human labor we need to do to perform certain battlefield tasks, particularly around command and control. So it, it's changing the the feel of the battlefield and increasing the tempo of the battlefield um, as well. Because it, you know, as you are able to synthesize uh, information, uh, you're able to make decisions more quickly, and as you're able to make decisions more quickly, the battlefield speeds up. Mm -hmm. And uh, what what might be a scenario that uh, we could see that play out in? Maybe, maybe just in fiction. I think you're seeing it play out real time in in Ukraine. I mean, mm -hmm. the targeting that we've seen the Ukrainians are, are able to do, the way they have, I think, very effectively synthesized uh, new platforms. You know, drones, for instance, use them to canvas the battlefield and create information networks, and then synthesize all the information that come that are coming back from those drones and use them for targeting purposes. And that targeting data is being fed to oftentimes older platforms, you know, towed artillery um, or, or high Mars in some cases that's able to very effectively and quickly target Russian units. You know, these are Russian units that are fighting, you know, in many of the same places where the Germans and Russians fought in the Second World War. But, you know, back in the Second World War, the, the targeting, you know, the targeting decision making wasn't so quickly. So, you know, a Russian unit that was stopped at a bridgehead for 15 minutes, maybe wouldn't find itself suddenly under, you know, devastating Ukrainian artillery fire uh, because they've been targeted and spotted. But that is what the artificial intelligence and uh, these new technologies and drone technologies uh, allow us to do on the battlefield. Wow. And you said that the next novel will also deal with um, a civil war in America. Um, what what could spark that off? It would seem that there's always often talk of this lately with all the tension, and yet at the same time there's this idea that we, we're past it, that um, it's just not in our nature to to start a civil war, that we're too smart for that. Um, what could spark something like that off? Well, you know, in in a situation we imagine um, the the president of the United States dies under. Uh, disputed circumstances so there is a disagreement about the narr the narrative around his death you know one side believes he's been assassinated the other side does not and that kind of that that precipitating incident creates a, a national crisis that takes us sort of up to a, a civil war but you know these the the spark is always very unpredictable in these cases right for instance like you know who would have thought that uh when Mohammed Bouazizi, a Tunisian fruit vendor, lit himself on fire, the entire order in the Arab world would collapse. You know, we never really, we never really know these things. They're very, very difficult per, to predict. I think the one thing that we can see, though, is when you sort of have that type of latent discontent, it's easier to sort of to predict and see all of the dry kindling than it is to know exactly where that spark is going to come that lets the kindling on fire. So I think there are many commentators now who would say. You know, if you look at the United States, if you look at the dysfunction in our politics, there's a lot of kindling there. And we need to keep the spark away from the kindling and hopefully get rid of the amount of kindling by acting more um, functional in our interactions with one another um, and tone down the rhetoric in, in our politics. So I'm not predicting a civil war in the United States, but like with 2034, it wasn't a work of prediction. You know, 2034 was always written as a work of speculation, saying we're not saying this is going to happen. We're saying but this is how it could happen. Mm -hmm. And it also seems that, um, well, I think, I think there's even a, a line from your book, um, something like the curse of domestic politics drives international policy, that maybe we, um, we lose track of our goals as a nation outside if we get so drawn into them inside. How do we resist that force to just keep looking at ourselves rather than um, you know, considering our role in the broader world? Well, it's it's very I mean, it's distinctly American to behave that way. It's often been said mm -hmm. that the way, you know, war, war is the way Americans learn geography, <laughs> which is, you know, you know, we'll sit here, right? And we'll, we'll stare at our navel as long as we can. And we'll be, 
hotly, you know, debating, I don't know, whatever, whatever some Kardashian is doing until the last possible moment when we're forced to actually look up and take stock of the world around us and realize it's burning and we maybe need to do something. So I do think there, you know, there is something distinctly American about that type of behavior, you know, because it's our geography. I mean, we have, you know, we have a neighbor to the north and a neighbor to the south who don't present any real threat to us who are generally aligned with and we have oceans on either side of us so we don't pay attention the way that people pay attention to these issues if they live in you know, let's say poland um, um but that being said i think you know when we you know we just cataloged a little bit some of the national security threats that exist in the united states around the world i would argue that the greatest national security threat that we face is our own domestic dysfunction and our adversaries perceptions at times that America is so dysfunctional, they won't be able to get their act together to counter us if we do X, Y, or Z. And in some cases, our adversaries have been correct about that. Uh, you know, in other cases, they can be proved wrong. Um, but we should never discount how much our domestic dysfunction works against our own international interests because our adversaries continually try to use it against us. Hmm. How can we prevent that internal uh disconnection from from impairing us as a nation you know I, I i mean i wish brendan i could sit here and give you in like you know one minute the prescription on how we could heal all of america's divisiveness and woes um you know listen i think there are many causes of this i think that um you know our media uh obviously hasn't done us many favors there is a there's a very big profit motive that exists in keeping America divided. You know, if you can keep half of America angry against the other half of America and keep them watching television or scaring, staring at some screen that you own, you will make a lot of money. And so there are regrettably many people who have figured this out, uh, whether they work in social media or on cable news. So our media has sort of migrated to this place where division is rewarded. Uh, and that has migrated to, um, to our politics, to the way to the money that exists in elections. If you look back um, at elections uh, in decades past, for instance, uh, and I write about this a little bit in the Fifth Act, the book I wrote about Afghanistan, is the 1980 Carter Reagan election. The total expenditure on that election was around $300 million adjusted for inflation today. So that's $300 million in today's dollars. You know, our last election was $14 billion. And that's because there's an entire political, uh, what I would call a political industrial complex that has grown up around our politics, um, where you know th- this money isn't being spent to you know better engage voters civically. It's being spent, spent because there's a whole industry that's grown up around this, much in the way that Eisenhower warned in his farewell address about the military industrial complex and his fears that defense industry would begin to drive defense policy and our nation's defense policy. I think there is a very similar, I wouldn't say fear, reality at this point in the United States that a politics industry has sprung up and it's the politics industry that is defining our our national life. And that politics industry needs to be fed and what feeds it is uh, a, just like you had the, the Soviet US divide in the Cold War when Eisenhower warned about the political industrial or the military industrial complex, you now have a Republican Democratic binary that exists today that feeds the political industrial complex. And so I just think one thing you can do just as an individual is, you know, if you open Twitter or you read some news article and it makes you really mad, maybe like just take two seconds and ask like, hey, or maybe my emotions being manipulated here um, for profit or maybe they, you know, or maybe are they being manipulated by you know, not only some politician, but also, um, you know, the, the people who are pushing out these stories. Um, and oftentimes I think that might be the case, you know, division sells, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Would you say that's the, the highest leverage thing that individuals could do is just to, to have that more critical view of, of the news and Twitter and that sort of thing? Sure. I think it's a great thing to do. I mm-hmm. mean, again, just, you know, just, just way to beat. And, uh, and if someone is encouraging you to be angry at someone else and to look at your neighbor and say, that person is the enemy, Ask yourself, you know, what is that person's motive for wanting me to see the world through that lens? Um, Listen, do I think do I think that can heal all of our problems? No, not necessarily. But if you know, if 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 like if maybe like me, sometimes you feel despair on this issue 
um, I know I sometimes try to like wait a minute before I allow myself to be uh, taken advantage of emotionally in that way. Mm -hmm. I'm curious for myself too with with this show. I think because I'm a veteran, um, I think people assume a certain political stance, and and maybe I don't get the same spread of guests uh, across the political spectrum. Do you think that there's there's something that I could be doing to to make this more effective about this issue, trying to get a, a broader political spread of guests or something like that? I think the one thing I feel sad about is listen. If you look at if you look at countries that are truly dysfunctional, you know, you look at a place like you know like Lebanon in the 1980s. It's when it's <clears throat> when politics infect every part of our lives. Like politics shouldn't be our entire life. Politics should should be like this very narrow thing that we talk about, you know, every now and again, and it doesn't define us. But sadly, you know, every single facet of American life now is touched by politics and seems to have some type of political bias that you can identify. I mean, everything from, you know, the toys your children buy to the movies you go see, like we all know that they have, they sort of, they lean one way or they lean the other way. And, and that's so sad because it didn't used to be this way. And it's such a very clear indicator of the, the sickness that exists in our land that every facet of our life is politicized. You know, up to including who comes on a show or, you know, I work in the media. I know like, you know, every show has or seems to have, oh, well, they lean this way or they lean that way. And it's too bad that we can't just have a conversation that's not a political conversation. And I think it's interesting if you look at American institutions, um, the one American institution that is always ranked highest with regards to trust, the trust and confidence of the American people is the U.S. military. And I would argue one of the reasons for so long as faith in institutions has been deteriorating across the board that the military has uh, has held on to that trust and confidence has been because up until very, very recently, it was probably one of the very last institutions in American life that did not express an overt political bias one way or another. It was truly one of the last national nonpartisan institutions. But we've seen, you know, really in the last probably three or four years, a effort to politicize the U.S. military. And I would argue, as we've seen the U.S. military become increasingly politicized, we are also now, and you're seeing this in the polling, a downward trend in the trust and confidence people have in the U.S. military. And you've seen that correspond with other institutions like the the Supreme Court, for instance. So uh, so with regards to your question, how do I get people on, you know, with political bias? It's sort of like, you know, I wish I wish I, I what I hope for your show is that like so many parts of American life, it could just be free of a political bias and be free of having to have everything in our lives be political because it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Uh, In your book, 2034, you have a discussion of maybe more independent candidates candidates rising, but also maybe they're seen as weak for um, being kind of in the middle of the road. Um, what, What do you think of a leader in the future who could be a unifying force in America? Do they need to be independent or what would that leader look like? Well, so in 2034, the, the the president of the United States, we actually we don't we don't by name because um, the the narrative actually happens sort of one level below the president and the principals. So most of the you know the characters in the book are sort of there, you know, the people working on their staffs, uh, and this sort of comes to this idea that in history, big doors swing on small hinges. We wanted you, the reader, to sort of be meeting the hinges that these big doors are swinging on, um, but. The, the president is a woman, which I think is non-remarkable. I sort of will be shocked if by 2034 the United States hasn't had its first female president. But what is maybe you know more distinctive is that um, she is the first president since Washington to be elected as a political independent, so without a party. And I actually think that is um, much that's you know that's not improbable at all. You know, if we look the um, as much as our national conversation is dominated by the Republican and Democratic parties. The plurality of Americans identify as independents. They don't identify with either party. And that has been a steady trend for decades now that the Republicans and Democrats are bleeding, um, are bleeding members. So, so politically, I think it aligns. Um, also, I'll be candid with you. Narratively, um, because we're telling this story, uh, a problem that we had early on is because, again, everything on our lives is political. <laughs> if we had made the president in this book a Republican, that would bring with it a whole bunch of baggage. If we made the person a Democrat, it would bring a whole separate set of baggage. So it's like, how do we tell this story without a president of either party? And it's like, well, we'll make them an independent, you know, and that's an, and that's interesting. And that speaks to sort of what's going on in American politics right now. We're all kind of having this be a book that doesn't, you know, shut off one half of the readers because, you know, 
they hate the Republican president or they hate the Democratic president that we chose. Right. I, I wonder, how does an independent uh, gather momentum in a system where it seems you, you, you've got to gather that 51 percent and and that's your only hope? Well, it's very I mean, listen, it's very, very difficult um, for a uh, an independent candidate in the United States to do well, particularly at the presidential level. And, I, you know, I would argue that the system I mean, I wouldn't argue. I'll tell you, the system is absolutely rigged against them. So. Uh, unlike, you know, a parliamentary system where representation is done proportional to how much votes you have in the United States, we have a winner take all system. So, you know, if you were to have three candidates and somebody wins, you know, 34 percent of the vote, you know, they win everything. And uh, so, again, it's winner take all. And that has traditionally made it very, very difficult for independents to um, to gain traction. Um, and that's what sort of has led us to a, a two party system. And then additionally, um, you know, getting on the ballot in all 50 states is very difficult. There are fundraising limitations that are placed on independent candidates that are not uh, placed on the candidates of the Republican and Democratic parties and the debates as well. Um, there are constraints to get that person into the presidential debates. So, you know, our system is very much uh, geared towards the two major parties. I would actually argue that uh, Donald Trump, when he ran as president, actually was an independent. The way he ran as an independent was he just hijacked the Republican Party. I mean, he was he was not a Republican figure. I mean, you know, things have changed, but he hijacked the party kind of, you know, like sort of night of the living dead, took it over, you know, took it over, zombified it and used it to run his sort of unhinged, you know, independent candidacy. Uh, so I would argue he isn't. He isn't. And he was an independent. Mm, that's interesting. I, I wonder if we'll see more of that. I live in Los Angeles and uh, we, we just had a, a hot mayor race and Rick Caruso right. Um, set himself up as a Democrat to, to run in that race, because I think that's probably the only chance you have of winning in Los Angeles. But uh, there's, there's probably more argument that Rick Caruso was not a traditional Democrat. I, I, and I think, I, think you're, I think you probably will see more of that. And I think you'll particularly see that as the Republican and Democratic parties, um, you know, gerrymander and legislate at the local level so that there are non-competitive elections, so that there are parts of America where you really just have one party rule what you'll eventually see is disparity within that one party. Um, and I think that's something we should be very worried about in the United States, too, is this 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 segregation, this political segregation that's existing in the country. So anywhere you go, you will no longer have competitive politics and non-competitive one party politics does not, you know, give give you know Joe's citizen um, the best policies because it's non-competitive. Mm -hmm. So for folks who want to see something uh, you know, a better place in America, not a civil war. Um, what would be models, maybe models in history, models in literature that we could look to? I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to necessarily answer for like a specific historical model, but maybe more with an idea. And maybe it's an optimistic one. <clears throat> you know, oftentimes as Americans, we think of ourselves as a very young people. You know, we live in the new world, not the old world. Um, our culture and our nation are, you know, are only 250 years old compared with, you know, many of the, the cultures of Europe or, you know, or the Chinese, which is a culture that goes back thousands of years. But when you look at the United States, actually, we might be a very young people. But we're a very old nation. And if you look actually, you know, at, at democracies or nations, there are very few nations when you look around the globe that have had the same system of government for nearly 250 years. I mean, you know, look at Europe, look at look at Germany, look at France, you know, look at Russia. I mean, all of those nations, they've enjoyed the same system of government for, you know, some cases a century, many just a few decades. Um, and when you think of us that way is actually no. Yeah, yes, we might be a young people, but we're a very old nation. Um, it gives me hope that we're going to kind of iterate our way to a more sort of reasonable politics. And I hope we can get to that place without too much existential pain, without a civil war or some other type of um, calamity. But I think our, our, our system of government has shown itself to be pretty resilient um, through the centuries. And I, I, I imagine it will continue to do so. So I guess I would answer your question say my historical example is us. Well, that, that gives me a lot of hope. Uh, before I ask my last question, Elliot, where can folks find out more from you online? I have a website, uh, ElliotAckerman.com, two L's, one T, and I'm on uh, Instagram, I'm on Twitter, and you can pick up my books, you know, anywhere good books are sold, but, uh, you know, always try to support your local bookstore, because um, that's worth doing.
Great. We'll put links to that in the description for everyone to check out. And Elliot, my final question is, um, you talked in the beginning about having narratives about what a success in war looks like. Um, in the near future for America, what's, what's the narrative, what's the story that we could tell ourselves about what we're aiming for as success as a country? You know, I think I think success is when we can start to come together again uh, around just certain, you know, shared uh, ideals. And uh, that doesn't mean we're perfect. That doesn't mean we can't have disagreements. But I think you know it's important to remember that, you know, like the United States has always been about an ideal. And an ideal, by definition, is a mark on the wall that you're striving for. You know, you're trying to jump up and touch this mark. And oftentimes you'll never you'll never reach it. But the mere act of reaching for it is noble and worth doing and we'll come at it in different ways. But, we, you know, I think as long as we're all reaching for some of these same ideals, um, that has a lot of merit. And, you know, and I, you know, some people might say, you know, America is built on a false ideal and they're very critical of the United States. I think it's important to point out like an ideal can be neither true nor false. Right. By definition, it is a mark on a wall that you're trying to get to. Um, so instead of sort of parsing, uh, our sins, I hope we can, you know, be aware of our sins, be educated about our sins, but realize that this country isn't about, you know, parsing the truth or the falsity of some, you know, idea. It's about embracing the fact that we're trying to get to that idea. Uh, and again, so by definition, ideal, it's not true or false. It's a mark on the wall we're reaching for. So what makes me optimistic and I hope like future generations and I have kids, you know, like they just keep, they keep reaching for it. Awesome. Well, Elliot Ackerman, thank you for joining me and putting that nuance on this idea and, and painting that vision. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Thanks for watching this episode. To help get more great guests on the show, be sure to subscribe.